Marshall Sager here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Everybody, welcome back to the show. As we've discussed for the past week, we are exploring different formats. This is an episode that's not going to be an interview. It's just a back and forth with me and Sagar discussing various interviews we've done, different topics, audience questions, and just our general take on the broader situation. After we do this month of Ukraine content, we're going to keep doing this format. We'll find the exact way to do it, but we know you'll get a kick out of it, and that is great. Sagar, let's just start off here. We're recording this on Wednesday morning on March 9th. What's just your broad, from your, especially your breaking points daily news perspective, what's just your broad assessment? Yeah. Um, I mean, it honestly hasn't changed that much. And I think the Russians are in a period of kind of strategic patience. They're literally just doing the same things that they were, and they're trying to figure out how to react to both the global situation and the situation on the ground. So if you look at the battle map, not a lot has changed since the last time that we spoke, Marshall. That convoy never ended up doing much whenever it came to Kiev. The encirclement and the pincer movements continue. Yes, Russia has had some military objectives. I do think, though, and I said this last time, and a lot of what you've been doing with your interviews basically confirms there's only one way that this thing goes. Putin is not going to give up. The West, obviously, is financially completely cut off Russia. We can get to that. And we are in for a full-scale Chechen civil war and uh, Aleppo-type response. The thing is, is that it takes a while to get those resources, military equipment, and all of that brought to bear. But all of the military analysis that I've seen so far is that the worst is absolutely yet to come. And I say this with respect to the Ukrainians. I got, you know, nothing but like I admire the heroism, but let's just be honest here about military capabilities and what's to come. I think hundreds of thousands of people are going to be killed in the next couple of years. So it's a sobering situation. It's a sobering situation and it just speaks to it speaks to a frustration I've had, and this came out during the David Kilcullen episode. A lot of folks are looking purely at the military question and separating the political question here. Militarily, a lot of folks on Twitter who are as hawkish as I am are, are overstating Ukraine's yeah. military to military abilities to win this. It's, it's, it's really painful when I see folks see a T-80 tank pulled by a tractor. Once again, Huge accomplishment, total disaster for Russia. I think the biggest thing that I'm fascinated by long-term, and I'm looking for this analysis, is how cratered Russia's actual military reputation is. This is not the Russia of the, of the Soviet Union where mm -hmm. the general consensus was if the Soviets wanted to conquer all of Western Europe just through sheer manpower, technological force, nuclear threat, they could have pulled it off if they wanted to. I don't think anyone believes that right now. That being said, there's a difference between that lack of capability and the fact that if Putin wants the country, he could take the country. Now, that's a military victory, but the real situation that Putin seems to have walked himself into, and we talked about this with Coco, and I want to hear this from you, is I don't know what political victory looks like for him, because every single day that he stays on, every single additional death that occurs, his political position abroad weakens and weakens and weakens. Every day this continues, the less likely the financial sanctions are going to go away. And a lot of folks talk about how they're afraid that Putin is going to grow closer to China. And that's something that we in the West should be concerned about when it comes to the broader strategic picture. But if you're Russia, just imagine how terrible that actually is. Putin set out to rebuild the, the Russian empire. He, he was very explicit about this. This isn't rebuilding the Soviet Union. This is, I am the leader who's going to make up for the mistakes of Lenin at Brett Lefos. People really liked when you put on your grad school hat and explain in the history there, right? He, that, this was the thing. He was going to make up for the mistakes, not only of 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed, but of 1917. Look at what he's actually done. He has completely destroyed Russia's economy by inviting the West to do this. And then B, if he's remembered for anything, it's going to be this is a guy who sold Russia at a bargain rate to the CCP for a failed, poorly calculated invasion. That, once again, will result in hundreds of thousands of deaths and could possibly result in acquisition of territory in Ukraine. But if you look at the scope of history, if you look at his narrative, what a disaster. You're not Peter the Great there. You're, you're just another failure. Oh, totally. It's a complete failure. Um, and it's, it's just important to balance that. Like, for example, I saw today Ian Bremmer 
I see no way Putin can emerge from this war in anything but a radically worse position, politically, economically, strategically. Every day that passes, it gets worse for him. All of that is true. And the subtext and continue is that Putin's regime will fall. Well, guess what? I was here and following the news daily in 2015. I remember the confidence, which with we all thought, we're like, man, Assad is done. He's dead. It's never going to happen. Yeah, well, uh, what we did not calculate is that Assad, in conjunction with Putin, were willing to literally burn the entire country to the ground just in order to remain in power. And that's going to be the exact same situation that we have here. I think Putin has turned himself into like a Kim Jong-un um, or a Bashar al-Assad type figure, global pariah, obviously dependent on client states. In one of those examples, literally China, um, kind of ironic whenever you think about it, but it's a cope and a fantasy to think that he's gone. I just don't think so. Uh, especially after that interview you did with Nate Sibley. Um, it's like the oligarchs don't matter as much anymore. They're just as afraid as everybody else inside of Russia. And if you think that they're going to let people leave, you're crazy. They're already uh, putting people in the border crossings in Georgia, where a lot of Russians were trying to flee. The only people who are going to get out of the dual citizens, uh, everybody else, they're stuck. And they're living in a whole new world inside that country. Yeah, I saw a Russian reporter tweet that they escaped to Estonia by walking in the yeah. woods to cross right. a unguarded border. That's we talk a lot about 2022 and how the world has changed and COVID. And this is not this was just not in the cards for and it's it's just wild how quickly that's really shifted. But I, I want to pick up what you're saying around Assad because this is another mistake. Once again, it's important that I, as a hawk, check myself. I want people to stop talking about regime change in <laughs> Russia. Stop. Because you're right. The Assad point is just very clear right now. Putin, I just don't see him going. I don't see the Russian people revolting. I think he has learned the lesson from the CCP in the sense that, look, if you crack down on the internet quick enough, if you punish and jail opposition quick enough, if you just completely cut, like Russia is about to cut itself off from the global internet. They if you are, are just yeah, if, 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 if you are a and once again, this is why authoritarianism is so deadly. This is a system where, look, it's all about Putin, Syria. It's all about Assad. So in that case, those two dictators are going to say to themselves, we're going to risk all of that for we, we, we are OK being pariah states for the rest of our lives. So long as we, we so long as so long as we survive. That's just the key thing here. And the other thing I want to just build on this, too, is. Those hundreds of thousands of deaths, it's, it's, it, it's, just, it's just really, it's, it's, it's tough because the no-fly zone debate is also, is also, has also just come in here too. And this is just the point where we have to recognize that the debate for us, now that we've ruled out the no-fly zone, now that we've ruled out sending NATO troops, Biden just nixed sending the MiG-29s, the debate in the West is going to be, given the fact that we are projected to suffer through this horrible insurgency and this horrible war, what policy we're going to choose. Um, so something I want to talk with you about and get your perspective on uh, another category of terrible, terrible policy, but it's not even policy, but the, the organic backlash against Russia-centric things. Mm. So I we, we got in a debate with this on Signal. I supported, for example, the Berlin Philharmonic um, letting go a, a major person in the symphony who was a close friend of Putin, who had praised the seizure of Crimea, who very directly had campaigned with Putin. I think that's a situation where if you have any public facing institution and organization, you should not want to be affiliated with Noxus people. I, I get that individualized case. I know there's another side to this, but that's just my general perception. However, folks who are changing the name of Moscow Mule, folks who are saying, oh, like we're not going to support Russian restaurants. That's just a disaster. So I'd love for you just to talk about, because I know this is where I did not think this would get this bad because it seems so obviously a terrible idea. And I'm once again, I still support the Berlin thing, but what's your take on that situation? It's just like freedom fries mania. I don't even know how else to describe it. You know, a friend of ours put it well, I won't quote him, um, which is that this is what war looks like. And it's like, whenever these edge cases and the insanity of it, it can always move forward. Whenever you have the emotions this high, 
I just think it's completely ridiculous. It actually backfires significantly because if you think of the Russians and Russian propaganda isn't going to make heyday of this inside of Russia, be like, look at what they're doing to our people in America. Look at what they're, you know, the cultural backlash, just as they did, you know, during the entire global war on terror, during similar examples with the uh, with Islam with Islam in the West. You're crazy if you think this isn't going to just harden support. That's the other thing. I want people to realize this. Uh, and it comes down to these sanctions. Never. What does history tell us about Russia? Never underestimate that population's capacity for suffering. Never. I mean, remember how bad it had to get with the czars for a revolution to actually happen. We're talking about a hundred years of mismanagement, robbery, literal slavery, a terrible war, and then another terrible war to get to the position where the population was ready to revolt. And even that revolution was more about the aristocrats and the bourgeoisie than it was about the peasants. In this particular case, Russia's economy is probably going to contract by 14%. I don't think it's going to do anything. Uh, I think a lot of them will suffer. I do not think it will move the domestic needle one way or the other. If anything, I think it will probably help Putin um, in terms of his solidification of power around the regime. I could be wrong. We'll see. Uh, but in general, all I see is that the most like, it's just same, this impulse is just so frustrating. I was pointing to the, uh, the case of Eric Deng. I don't know if people know who this is. He's a, a doctor on Twitter and he was the most mask the kids, strap the N95s, all of this. And then the moment Ukraine happens, this guy's entire feed transforms. He actually changes his Twitter bio, Marshall, from epidemiologist and COVID-19 uh, expert to now it's like Dr. Global Biosecurity. So now he's a biosecurity expert. And now everything is about Ukraine, no-fly zone. It's like this is the, whenever this became a part of the culture war, it has led to the most same idiotic uh, impulses that the culture war begets in our domestic policy. I don't know if you saw this today. The Guggenheim Art Museum, uh, they were calling for a no-fly zone, the artists, so they took paper airplanes in the middle of the building and threw them off of the uh <laughs> threw them off into the center. This this is not this is not it. Like and look, calling for a no-fly zone is a legitimate thing. I think it's stupid. Um, and we could talk for many, many reasons strategically why that is, but it's becoming part of the culture war, which is very destructive. Because when you have that edifice and that architecture that we have right now for domestic politics stuff and then you apply it to foreign policy, it can have major consequences. That being said, it is a evergreen part of war. So it's not like this is all that new. It, it's, it's really wild. I wanna read a comment that came in. We asked for these from an audience member and I actually really agree at this point. This mm -hmm. is from Mark S. You and Dimitri are both millennials. So I think there's an aspect of the, of the you and Dimitri are both millennials. So I think there's an aspect of the demonization of Russia that you don't understand and see. The Gen Xers, me by the way, and boomers spent a lot of time demonizing the Russians. They were the evil empire in the 1980s and before. The Ukraine war has started and Americans have carte blanche to return to Russia hate again. And it's like putting on an old comfortable coat. It downright feels nostalgic. Gen X and boomers are falling into muscle memory. And when you do that, you obviously are not skeptical. I think that's a really good way of putting it. Yeah, and that's why that's, it's that's funny. So I have not seen left, right, or center millennials fall into this he's actually he's actually that's, that's actually just a good point because for us and look the part of this this is once again as everyone knows i'm i'm adopted so like when i say like my, my ancestors it's through adoption not as a as a you know black person but my you know great grandmother's family spoke german in the home until 1914 1915 1916 they were german that immigrants was pretty and normal they too and it was normal like, it, normal. Was, it was yeah. normal they stopped because of hardcore anti-German discrimination in the United States. It was, and it's wild, but it got this bad. I'm not claiming that anyone is doing this today, but there clearly is this really dark impulse in American history. And just like you said, war in general, there was a German speaker in Illinois who was literally lynched mm -hmm. by a crowd because they heard him speaking German with a neighbor over his fence. So I just think that, and we'll get into Joe Biden now. Uh, there was a review who was unhappy with my Biden shilling. 
because frankly, I'll say it again, I will shill as much as possible. And so I think when it comes to the strategic military side, every single thing he's doing has just completely lined up with my perspective, rule out NATO troops, say no to the no-fly zone. He clearly does not care what a has-been general on MSNBC says. And then also like with the MiG deal, I think the MiG-29 deal was arguable on both sides. But once it became clear that there was ambiguity, what's this, what's this, what's that, there wasn't actually a consensus, Biden nixed it. These are good calls. And I will continue showing for those calls so long as he makes those right ones. Here's where he's just a total disaster. And this is where the critique of Biden's inability to articulate becomes a real issue. The fact that Biden is not giving an articulation of everyone, we may have this punishing sanctions sanctions policy, but we are not trying to hurt Russians. So back in this country, don't boycott Russian restaurants. Don't take down Russian performers. Don't make this about the Russian people. He needs to give that speech because he actually has an ability to actually check center-left institutions where the power actually resides here. No one cares what Glenn Greenwald says. Museums, symphonies, restaurants, Yelp, they actually care what Joe Biden said. I think if Joe Biden gave a speech saying, hey, Yelp, because once again, Joe Biden is very comfortable telling tech companies what he thinks they should do about content. Joe Biden should say, hey, Yelp, you should be concerned that people are review bombing mm-hmm. Russian restaurants yeah, which on crazy. your platform. Right. That's crazy. And I don't, but once again, Biden's not doing that. And that's a disaster. You know, like there's plenty we could talk on George W. Bush for, but what did George W. Bush do? I was do? about to bring it up immediately. Yeah, take yeah. it, take it. What he yeah, did September, about Muslims. September 7th, 2001, uh, George W. Bush visits the largest Wrong mosque. Day. S- September 7th. Yeah, September 7th. That's what happened. September 11th. Oh, oh, am I wrong? Oh, so sorry, sorry, sorry. It's <laughs> seven days. That's what I'm getting the number wrong. Or if I had it mixed up. September 17th, that's what it is. September 17th, 2001, Bush visits the largest mosque in the Washington area. And he's like, hey, this is not about Islam. This is not about a war with a religion. This is about a war with a very specific terrorist group. And by the way, I've always appreciated him for that because I was a kid after 9-11 and the only time I ever experienced any racism in my life was not in the 1990s, was actually post 9-11 during the invasion of Iraq. And so I have to believe that even though obviously people like me you know, did suffer, and that doesn't even compare to a lot of the Muslim population, that those words did not, in fact, at least have some impact. And I think that that is what is important to get from Biden. And this gets to my main critique of Biden, which is that so much of what he's doing may be defensible on the policy, although I disagree with the oil ban 100%, given the domestic political implications and economic uh, co- implications. We'll get into that one a little is later. It's not justified properly to the people. I don't support the oil ban, and I could give you a more articulate case Let's than the it. Biden administration has done. Here's what I would do if I was Joe Biden. I'd be like, look, Vladimir Putin has attacked Ukraine, a defenseless country, which did not ask for this, a war of choice, a war of aggression. The United States and its allies are moving together to defund the Russian war machine. You never even say oil. You just say defund the Russian war machine. I see all of you across the country concerned about the high prices at the pump. I give you my pledge as the president of the United States that I will do everything in my power to bring down the price at the pump, starting with, and then I would lay out an ambitious agenda. I would say the price of gas on the day of the invasion was $3, whatever, 50 cents or or whatever it was um, for the national average. The priority of this administration is to restore that price within two weeks. I have called the CEOs of Shell and Exxon to the White House where we will together come up with a plan that will be presented before Congress and passed within the next two weeks to give you relief at the pump. Instead, we get a bunch of culture war bullshit where the right can rightfully say that the Biden administration is ruling out domestic drilling, um, is doing nothing to alleviate prices at the pump. And then the freaking president himself yesterday says, nothing we can do. It's on Putin. Oh, nothing we can do? 
Uh, congratulations, you just spiked the Brent crude oil price on the commodity index, and you give us no hope. And here's the thing, Marshall, and this is part of why, strategically, the people who are pushing this oil ban, you are going to rue the day that you did so. The Russians' capacity for not getting the revenue on the oil does not even, is pales in comparison to the capacity, or sorry, I'm, I'm saying our capacity, to endure the suffering at the pump which is about to come, and it will actually probably lead to a reversal. I'm going to call it right now. About a year from now, prices at the pump are going to be $6 a gallon on national average, which means $7.50 for you folks who are living out in California. There will be domestic political turmoil, the likes of which we have not seen on gas and the economy in decades. It will be 1970s level. And there will be a push and populist support at the time for repealing the oil ban. And by the way, the war will continue during this entire period, and we will look weak and foolish for doing so. The only way it works is if you can alleviate price pressure. But he's given up on that from day one. And so this is going to lead to some bumbling, idiotic response six months from now, some shit that's not going to work. By that time, you're going to have the midterm elections where the Democrats are now big out to get literally crushed because they think that, oh, Putin's fault is okay enough of an excuse. You're the party in power. You could do something right now. You know, there's all kinds of uh, pieces of legislation, Marshall, that people have been sending me. There's actually one that was proposed like uh, 12 years ago about how you as an oil company will get a financial levy on you if you own a lease and you're not drilling on it, basically to encourage domestic production. Because right now the backlash is Wall Street. Wall Street is the one who does not want to invest in drilling because they lost $500 billion in 2018 by drilling too much. So right now the high gas prices are actually recouping the losses that they had previously. So that's why profit margins are so high. It's complicated. Because right? this quick is thing, where, the, the, the gas price yeah. was going up before any of this even happened. So right, right. is that the conference and, you're referring to? Yes. See, let me explain this too about why gas prices, where were they were, and why we're not drilling, um, and why um, actually U.S. government policy doesn't have even that much to do with it. Sorry, culture warriors. Which is that in 2018 we poured because there was like this mania about uh, drilling. We poured 500 billion. These are private investors into shale gas producers. They went and bought every lease under the sun and drill, 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 drill. drill. Well, what happened in 2020? COVID, right? So gas price plummets. These guys take a massive loss. On that massive loss now, we have all this money that's poured in, and then we have a demand shock because at the end of COVID, people start driving again, and the gas price goes up. Now, normally uh, at that time, you would see a commensurate increase in drilling and in production specifically on facilities that people own, but they don't want that because- with the profits and the money that's pouring in from the high gas price, they're recouping the loss that they made previously, and they're explicitly telling, the investors are telling the oil companies, no, you're not going to go and drill. So when we have a market problem like this, which has a strategic impact on the ability of the United States in order to have energy security, what does that mean? We need energy policy. We need government policy. Actually, we need an act of Congress. And there's a lot of different things we could do. You know, I've called for a nuclear new deal in conjunction with increased drilling and fracking, or at the very least, an incentive to producers in order to drill and uh, produce immediately to alleviate price pressure within at least six months. But look, I'm up for a debate and I don't really care as long as people get something. But the point is, is there's nothing, nothing from the president on this. So it devolves into culture war bullshit on, well, he should have done the Keystone Pipeline, you know, three, two years ago. And Biden saying nothing we can do. We're completely adrift as a country. And I don't know, I, I'm just in despair because look, there's a lot of books behind me right here. The worst possible domestic condition is a fractured American Republic, number one, an economic depression, which I do believe is coming, and not in the technical sense, economists, but $6, $6.50, whatever, gas price, combined with double-digit food inflation, combined with double-digit rent inflation, disaster. You could, can't spin it any other way. You don't have to call it a depression, be recession, whatever, you, whatever it is. Combine that, too, with lack of leadership 
And once again, on both sides, where we have Donald Trump once waiting in this ring and culture war on this side, and then an inept, bumbling, inarticulate president on the other side. I mean, that is the condition for what a moribund country for a decade plus. It's not a good situation for people. And, so that's why this, I'm so depressed right now. And this is what's wild for me. And this is where like this is the serious Biden criticism section. Once again, I genuinely think Biden was probably the only Democrat who could have beat Donald Trump. So yeah, this is right. not a if you're if you are to the Democrats in the audience, this is not me. This is not me doing a whole shtick of like, oh, like you should have picked someone else. Biden had an advantage, aka he could win. He has a cost. He just can't articulate. What I don't understand then is why the administration has been unable to find a substitute surrogate. There's been very few palace intrigue, what's going on in the White House books and reporting, because once again, the Biden administration is very competent when it comes to this versus the Bush like versus the Trump administration. This is an ideological point. Yeah. They just do not leak in the right. same way that Omarosa was going, Jesus, talk about people. You can't believe they were in good. Uh, like, th 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 this yeah. is such a normie MSNBC critique of Trump, but like, mm -hmm. really, like they just let so many ter genuinely terrible careerist people into that administration that there was enough leaks that support 50 trillion books. That isn't happening in the Biden administration. So an actual leak that I would like to get as an explanation for why the following isn't happening. I do not understand why. And once again, separate the fact that a lot of people in this audience do not like him on a personal level. I don't understand why Pete Buttigieg, who is very good at communication, who is good at going on Fox News and actually speaking to people, isn't the point man. Once again, yes, he's Secretary of Transportation. He's not the Vice President. He is not the Secretary of Defense. He's not Secretary of State. But during JFK's presidency, Bobby, you know, Bobby, you know, RFK, um, his younger brother, is the Attorney General. And he's the one negotiating with um, the Russians to pull Jupiter nuclear missiles out of Turkey in exchange for, for the Russians removing missiles mm -hmm. from Cuba. So there's actually a precedent for non-foreign policy cabinet members playing a real role here. And this is frankly a role that Pete needs to be doing. Like, once again, I don't understand why Pete is not giving the speech, which you I know just why. gave. I can tell you why. Why? Um, and it's terrible. It's a terrible reason. Pete wants to be president and Pete mistakenly believes that by placating the democratic NGO industrial complex is more important to his chances than actually being well-liked and doing something politically courageous. Calling for a nuclear power at wait, this wait, time- Wait, 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 just a okay. quick thing. I'm not talking, yeah. this, this is my key thing. You, you mentioned nuclear power in your thing, there, but he doesn't have to actually do nuclear no, power. No, 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 no. I'm saying, let me give you an example. Yeah. Calling and admitting gas price and the need for- fossil fuel drilling and all this goes against so much of the NGO industrial complex on wind and solar that they are literally unable to articulate this case whatsoever. I haven't seen anybody do it. A lot of the progressives are doing the same thing. They're like, yeah, but fracking is bad. Yeah. Okay. I agree. All right. I'm not saying it's a freaking best thing that's ever existed. Sorry, fossil fuel industry. It's still 50% of fucking coal though. And guess in terms what? Of CO, in terms of CO2 emissions. In terms of CO2. And guess what? We're not stopping driving anytime soon. So be realistic and let's pump some fucking oil out of the ground in the short term while we plan for the long term. I don't know why that is so difficult, but I do because on the right, which is definitely beholden to the fossil fuel industry, they don't want to talk about nuclear at all. They think that fracking is the be all end all, the ultimate solution to all of our problems. And they want to ignore the very cheap, you know, high capacity energy source that we could easily have if we wanted to invest in it. Then for a variety of cultural reasons, mostly being fear mongering from the boomers in the 1970s and the 1980s, combined with literal idiocy and lack of understanding of how energy grids work and how society works. The left has decided to embrace this like, oh, well, that's why we need wind and solar and there's nothing we can do to expand domestic capacity in the meantime. Both of those are dumb points. And the reason I get so fired up about this is it's not hard. Yes, I understand. Fossil fuels and international dependency upon this is bad. I think it leads to bad strategic consequences, hence you know, the United States having to, you know, hat in hand to the Emiratis and the Saudis and fly down to the Maduro regime. 
whatever you think of those, it's not a good situation to be in. Um, but on the other hand, you have people who are like, no, 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 this status quo, this is actually good. Uh, this is fine. Let's just tweak it a little bit on the edges. I just get so frustrated because it takes real political courage to do something about this. And, and you could actually, you could get it done. I, I really believe this. There are, I, I've gone ahead and checked at least three sitting GOP senators who are pro-nuclear power. Okay. I just got you to, there's an interesting coalition in order to get something that is done there. And at the very least, put something forward where you dare people to vote against a direct ability to lower price. Here, here's something I came up with. It's going to be my monologue on Thursday. Gas taxes, right? So we have a federal gas tax. We have state gas tax. They actually raise a shit ton of revenue on transportation. Okay, how about we do this? Let's repeal the federal gas tax, which would be about 18 cents roughly per gallon. And then uh, look at what every state across the country is that has a gas tax. And we say, you guys repeal it. The feds will replace the revenue. States lose no money. The states because they pay the for because the key detail is a lot That's of how they pay the gas tax rest. pays right. for a lot of serious infrastructure. Right. I want to I want to I want to build on yeah. what you're saying real quick. Though, it's not hard. We could do that. Your 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 focus. So I get your your critique of why that isn't happening on the energy side. But what I'm saying about administration surrogates is actually just much bigger than just that too. Mm. Like yeah. once again, you know who could actually deliver an effective speech? You know you know what you don't want to see. Because like, once again, Biden, there's, there's been a lot of actual reporting about this in the Washington Post. Biden is not a president who likes to go out and about in town. Um, Trump and Biden actually stay in the White House. Um, yeah, it's I actually, know. it's very, it's very it. unique given American history. Presidents are usually going out, they're going like Obama, once again, yeah, like, all to go to town. restaurants, there would be, yeah. there would be events and parties. And this seems kind of like, oh, like palatial. And this is Versailles in the 70s. No, like this is actually important because once again, politics is about coalitions and actually seeing people. You can't treat the White House like a hidey hole. Well, you know who should be going out to, you know what, I, this is what I want to see. Cause I, cause we actually do have a few people in the administration who listen to this. So I want them to actually hear this. I don't get why, I don't get why, um, Pete Buttigieg and Chastin don't get a babysitter. This is not a dunk. Like they should explicitly say that like, we got a babysitter and we're going to go dine at a Russian restaurant in DC mm -hmm. in That's solidarity with Russian Americans. I do not understand why, like it's easy for Joe Biden to go to Le Dip, which is Le Diplomat. It's uh, it's the um, infamous uh, DC French. It's fine. This it's fine. Shout it's, out. It's, you know, it's fine. Everyone who listens to this, it's not even that good. Anyway, continue. Yeah, but but but, but this is this is this is just like this is. So I get your point. I understand why the game theory of the nuclear mm -hmm. isn't happening. I don't understand why Pete Buttigieg is not going. He's a gay man. He could talk about discrimination on a personal level. That's good. That's good. This would that's be so point. easy. There's a move that you don't even have to go to Russia House. Russia House is a semi sketchy, um, but actually, but Russia House. This is a this is a restaurant in Northwest DC. Sorry, I have went spent oh, plenty of time, of time there. there. It's a great uh, someone, place. you know, as I understand it, like there there was a defacing of, of the restaurant. No, no, no. Um, worse. The, uh, their they windows were broken. The window They're was vandalized. Broken. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the, the Russian flag was taken down, which once again, like. I frankly like think is is a good thing. I I think Russia is a pariah state that deserves to be punished. I don't want them participating in international games. Like the fact that there was a Russian athlete at the global gymnastics championships who was wearing Z, which is like the sign of the Russian military, and the invasion mm -hmm. on his actual um, leotard during the awards ceremony is a disaster. Um, but that said, if someone is taking down a Russian flag because Russia is a pariah state. That's great. If they're taking down the flag because they are afraid that people will literally attack their place of business, that is a disaster. And what Pete, because Pete could do it, Kamala, Kamala is a black Indian woman. No like, I mean, like, theoretically, like, I know. But. Like, you, but my point is, like, you and I, like, we live in center left spaces. We could, just mm -hmm. like you wrote a speech for Biden to give on energy, you and I could easily write a speech on what a minority friendly Democratic Party should say. And it's just shocking they're not doing it. Um, so we got we got a few more topics I want I want to hit. Um, let's 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 hit this one because this has been this is basically my rant where I'm frustrated. There's been a real gap on Twitter when it comes to folks not understanding who and who doesn't have agency in these debates. So people may have noticed a few days ago Russia put forth terms, everything from neutrality, installing your constitution that you'll never join NATO in the EU, to we get to keep the breakaway republics, to we could play a role in appointing the prime minister of Ukraine under Zelensky. 
demilitarization, on and on and on. These are these are the various terms that are being bandied about. Personally, I am the most fine with allowing the breakaway republics to leave. I think what should happen here is Zelensky or whoever, in, if, you know, obviously I don't want this to happen, but whoever succeeds and if something happens, what I think they should basically say is, look, you know, Russia's imperialist aggression took these territories. Any Ukrainians who live there should come here. Yeah. Don't align yourself with the pariah fading power. We are clearly a part of the West. If you want to, it's, it's, this is like, this is the West Germany, East Germany thing. East, Ger the reason why the Soviets had to put up a wall is people actually didn't want, want to stay in the economically hey, cut off suck. pariah East. And guess what? The breaker republics are going to suck to be colloquial about it. So let them go. There are a lot of traitors there. I mean that genuinely. There are a lot of good people there, but there are traitors. Say, good people, come. The West could easily provide relocation funds. There could easily be, a, there's already talk of a Marshall Plan for Ukraine after this conflict is over. This can be, this can be adjudicated. So that's what I think is, is up for grabs there. But once again, that isn't up to me. And it's actually not up to Joe Biden either. And there's just a lot of folks who think for whatever reason that Joe Biden and the West are calling the shots when it comes to the exact terms that are accepted or not. Because as should be clear to everyone right now, if you're looking at this analytically, the Ukrainians are not going to accept any of those terms that are articulated right now. Zelensky does not want to give up the breakaway, breakaway provinces. And I guarantee you, if you went to Joe Biden or Western leaders and said, hey, Putin promises to save face or keep the, the breakaway provinces and then retreat, we would take the West would take that deal. But the reason the deal isn't getting taken is the Ukrainians themselves don't want it. So there's this weird contradiction between people who, before this crisis, this happens a lot on crypto libertarian Twitter, who were saying, we live in a multipolar world where the US doesn't have this ability to impose its will on countries. Well, right now, as this stands, given the fact that the Ukrainians have held out for so long relative to what was predicted, they are not going to give up. And it's insane to think that we have the ability right now to dictate those terms. Like, Sagar, you laid out the apocalyptic vision of what hundreds of thousands of deaths are going to look like. Right now, as it stands, it appears as if the Ukrainians are fine paying that risk. As frankly, I think they justifiably are. The last time Russia conquered Ukraine, millions of people died in the mass famine during the Holodomor. Once again, I'm not claiming that Putin is Stalin and is going to install a mass collectivization process that destroys millions of people. But if that is your history, right? Like what if, what if we caused a mass famine in Mexico that killed millions and millions of people? I think 80 years later, that would determine their ability to take risks when it came to negotiation. So just what, what is your take on what would you Let's say you could impose peace terms. What, what would you be willing to impose, give up, whatever? And what do you think is actually driving the Ukrainians' reactions to those type of issues? Oh, yeah. I mean, look, I'll go further. I think they should give away Crimea, the Eastern Republics. And this is the key. If they actually meant it, no EU and no NATO. But the problem is, it's just so hard. Who is screwed it? it. I get, yeah, no, I, I get it. I, I get that's the thing. I get it, which is, and this is also the problem on the NATO front, which is that if it was just NATO, that's one thing. But if they couch it in their Russian way of being like NATO and demilitarization, it's like, okay, well, like you just invaded the country. Like we're not giving up our ability to arm ourselves. This is why, look, I just think it's irreconcilable. Mm -hmm. And the more you read about war, we are so early in this conflict, Marshall. It's been only 14 days. So like depressing. it feels like a lifetime, but war takes a long time. The ability to adjudicate and give up and the proliferation of myths and all that, we are in the infancy of this thing. Did you know right now in the middle of World War I, uh, trench warfare had not even started, right? Think about that. So this, is, defining, so this, so this, is, so this is August. This is yeah, August, August 1914. 1914. The German army is moving through Belgium. We don't even have the beginning of trench warfare. It's only been 14 days. Uh, in terms of the US campaign in Iraq, we still have not taken Baghdad. Like the war is actually still happening. So these things look like short things in retrospect. Whenever you read about it, you're like, oh, wow, the US took a Baghdad in three weeks. We have literally not been three weeks. So that's important to understand. We're in the infancy of this thing. In the first year of the Syrian civil war, it actually did look like there was going to be a free Syrian army of rebels who were non-Islamicized as a serious rebel faction that could contest the Assad regime. That didn't work out. 
they were actually militarily destroyed. So my point is, whenever it comes to this, is that, look, the hubris of men, but also the inability of every side to understand each other makes it so that a colossal amount of death has to occur before negotiating ta- ta- uh, negotiating table is going to happen. And that is just a constant throughout every war that I've ever read about. So I don't see a situation where hundreds of thousands of people are not going to die. That's just how it's going to go. Um, that's the only way I think that this will happen. I keep thinking, you know, there's the scene from Gladiator that's been making the rounds. It's like uh, Quintus uh, looks to Russell Crowe and he's like, people should know when they're conquered. And he looks at him and he's like, would you, Quintus? Would I? It's a great point, though, because it's easy for me. I live here in D.C. It's not my country. You know, Luhansk, Donetsk, Crimea, it's like whatever. I'm like, look, just give it up. Take the deal, man. Even NATO, EU, if they really mean it, if you get to continue to remain in part of the country, get them the hell out of here. Save as many people as possible. Would I take that deal here in Washington, D.C.? No, there's no way in hell I would. I'd be out there fighting with everybody else, throwing Molotov cocktails. I don't say never, you know, before so-and-so hundred many hundred thousands are dead. I get it. I, I get where they're coming from. So it's not my role. This is also where I think some strategic balance also and just managing of expectations is so important. I can't emphasize this. Guys, it's so, so, so early. How this thing is going to shake out, we have no idea. That's why the moment this happened, I was like, this is going to be years, years, uh, especially in terms of now with the West response, there ain't no off-ramp here. We've given them very, very little choice. I mean, you could roll back the economic sanctions, and I still think half the private sector stuff would remain in power. So the whole world has changed. Um, And in terms of how the settlement will come, it's going to take a long time. I mean, think about what first, I think the first two weeks of the American Civil War, I don't think there was a battle or any major battle. Uh, Other than that, you know, you have the, you know, the, the Fort firing Sumter, on Fort, Fort Sumter, right? I'm trying the, to think. Oh, you're right. The, you're right. The, like, the big bull run, right? So the, the yeah. big it took battles. Months. Yeah. Yeah. Think about that. Okay. Here. I just got it. So the battle of bull run was July 21st, 1861. So that's what, like uh, three, four months after Lincoln takes office. Cause I think Lincoln takes office in March of 1861. And then even the firing of Fort Sumter uh, yeah, it was months after. The, so, so Fort Sumter was in April. So there you go. That took three months in order for that to happen. And then think about the Battle of uh, Bull Run in the context of the entire ups and downs of the American Civil War. We're just so early here. Like it could be, and I actually think this will be, we will forget this entire period. Um, this is a lot like, what is the... Uh, the Winter War of 1939. You think you have the phony? It was called. It was the so phony basically war. the, the right. phony after war. So the, after yeah. so after the um, so what happens is um, you know August 31st, September 1st, 1939, the Nazis invade Poland. The French and British had given Poland a security guarantee. They declare war on 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 uh, Germany. Over that, Germany conquers Poland after a month or so, but. For the next eight months, basically nothing happens. Yeah, eight um, so months. US, and, and and by the like, way, like this this also speaks to how wild this history is. You know, at that point, there is a world where the French could have invaded Germany. Yeah, um, where there could have actually been advancements, and basically you have this weird period where the debate was: Are they going to go further? So th- that's where it gets interesting. I, th- I think what I as I'm hearing you articulate this, here's what I want for people, and we're going to have some of the folks who support this basically strong arm the Ukrainians into accepting peace terms position. Um, Here's what my beef is. And we'll have these folks on this show so we can be completely fair, but not just like talking shit. Because if I'm going to critique my episode of Dimitri came out yesterday, I talked a little too much shit relative to engaging with people who aren't there. We don't usually do that. And uh, I'm not going to always acknowledge critiques I get from people, but that was actually a very, a very, very fair one. If I'm going to talk shit, I'll do it to someone's face. So here's basically what I would ask of of these people. And I will ask this question on the show. Folks who support the de-escalation off-ramp position will often combine two things. They will say, Ukraine needs to accept peace terms, and our financial nuke of Russia's economy is too aggressive and needs to be pulled back. So you're proposing two things. You're proposing that they, you, know, you um, give Russia something, and then we also limit the economic punishment we're giving them. The person you have to convince is Zelensky 
why under those terms does Putin not show up in two or three, two or three years to get his revenge? Because once again, I can see, I've not seen one single convincing argument that that basically wouldn't happen. Because here's what happened in this case. These folks are saying, we need to give a Putin an off ramp. We have to pull back the economic and financial sanction of the country. Now, doing that, and once again, the fact that Biden isn't making this case is a whole problem, doing that would allow Russia to rebuild their economy. It would enable them to re-import um, military parts, rebuild their, um, naval, their, their naval and air fleets, all those different bits. How do they not just reconstitute themselves and come back in three years? Because here's what almost certainly happens under that circumstance. Putin has been, any, no matter what happens, Putin has been humiliated. Uh, and he sold half his country to, to China. That's why so, this isn't going to happen. So, so this is so he he he's been he's been humiliated. He knows that if he if basically even if he takes the separatist provinces, even if Ukraine never joins NATO, which it's not going to do in any foreseeable future in your or my lifetimes, he still goes down in history as the guy who couldn't let the Cold War go, overreached, and then mortgaged the country to China. That is what AP world history, if the AP program's still around, if, this is what our great, this is, this is what our great grandchildren will basically study if this just ended tomorrow the way the de-escalators want. What Putin will do is he will come back to the border again and say, look, we talked about this from the start, we didn't denazify the regime. We didn't demilitarize the regime. The discrimination is still because let's, let's, let's get real. And this is why civil wars are terrible. There is going to be Ukrainian and Russian violence. Um, there, we, we all know it's going to happen. Um, it's Already almost certainly happening. happening. Yeah. There is going to be Putin. If Putin, I, I think Putin's claims of discrimination and violence were total BS. But let's get real. Like, let's say there was some type of settlement that happened. The second that happens, you have independent militias on both sides. We're going to start killing each other. There's going to be some mayor of a Russian speaking province who was sleeping with a, with a Russian officer or maybe actually exchanging right. details. Yeah, and there's going to be reprisal right. killings. There are going to be Russian speakers who are paraded in the streets, Ukrainian speakers in both sides. So Putin will have examples of this. He's going to come back. And you know what he's going to say? He's not going to make the mistake of allowing the West to support to send military arms into you into Ukraine. Because most what he did very early in the conflict, he said, hey, if you send forces or do a fly zone, I will introduce tactical nukes to the battlefield. Mm -hmm. I think the next time this comes around, he would say, I will treat any bullet that comes over the border as a potential example of something that would necess necessitate a tactical nuke on the battlefield. The second that happens, the West backs down and Ukraine is screwed. So once again, if you are a de-escalator, your, your case isn't to me, it's not to Joe Biden, because like frankly, these are not the people who are making the actual decision here. You have to convince Ukraine that their national, and also last thing, Sagar, and then I'll let you like rapidly get to this part, but Putin called into question the existence of Ukrainian identity. And he said, if this resistance continues, Ukrainian statehood is up for grabs. Yeah, I do not think right. I do not think that Americans understand how insane that is. And once again, the last time Ukrainian existence was up for debate, millions of people died in the 1930s from mass and purposeful starvation. When Stalin was literally attempting to destroy Ukrainian identity. You should ask yourself, why do so many Russian speakers live in certain parts of Ukraine? It's because the Soviets purposely moved them in in order to shift the population balance. I, I really want to hear people who are basically pushing de-escalation actually make the case to Ukraine that in these circumstances, it, it's safe, because I just don't see it. There is no case uh, right now, I would say. all This is the it's kind of like a trap of history, inevitableism that I'm falling into, but... The case and the time for de-escalation was probably six, seven months ago. That being said, look, I do think we backed Putin into a corner. Uh, but look, what's done is done. So now I'm just being a critic, being like, well, I personally, I would not have banned Russian oil. I would not have encouraged, you know, McDonald's and Coca-Cola and all these other companies to pull out of Russia. I will, would not have dropped even close to the size of the financial neutron bomb. I also would not have expanded NATO or even given NATO the uh, invitation to Ukraine in 2008. But all those things are done. So now yeah. it's a question of, well, what now? And that's why, look, I'm a critic of the past policy. I'll continue to be. But I'm just not going to sit there and lie to you that I don't think there's an off ramp. I, I just don't think it exists. Um, at this point, we are in a full-blown conflict. The Ukrainians believe that they can stave off 
you know, this relative to what's coming. They don't know yet, frankly, in my opinion, what's going to hit them. You know, there's a great post I saw, which said that for years, I've been trying to convince people the Russian military is not 12 feet tall. And now I'm going to spend years convincing people that they're not four feet tall either. An eight foot tall military is still really freaking strong. Um, these people have nukes. They have like very high tech cyber capabilities. They have the ability, look, they could remove Ukraine from the map tomorrow, right? If they wanted to, and it might get to that. Um, it, it really might from a conventional weapons point of view. Just remember the amount of our, uh, the amount of ordinance that we dropped on Vietnam throughout the entirety of the Vietnam war. More than that all stuff, of World War II. More than all of World War II, I think in a single operation, I want to say. It was some, it's, um, some, it's, some sho- it's, it's some shocking. Yeah. Metric. It's a crazy, like the entire, uh, the entire amount that we dropped in world war two in like response to the Tet offensive or something like that in like 1968 or 1969, that stuff can, and most likely will happen. So look, I don't agree with most of the current policy. I think it's locked us into a situation where conflict is now inevitable. And I think that people need to be honest about what it's going to look like. That's the problem. I, I don't think there is a possibility of de-escalation right now. Like, look, any deal, this is why it's going to be fight to the death, which is Ukrainians are not going to sign anything which says that we're going to demilitarize. It's just not going to happen. And the Putin uh, saying that Ukraine's not going to have a statehood is the most maximalist demand. It's, uh... And his compromise, right? His compromise, honestly, the moment I saw that speech before the invasion, what was it, 15, 16 days ago? I saw you react about, live to it. We were texting yeah, about it. It was the treaty. I was like, oh, there it is. I was like, it's, I was like, this is it. I was like, that's, it's over. He gave himself no off ramp. He's like, I'm going to recreate the Russian empire. Okay. Now you're, you're in for it now. The second and someone says like, that, what is yeah. least, he's, this? This is, once yeah. again, I, once that's said, <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, I know. I, and that, that's why I am, I'm not sympathetic, but I'm just like, I understand both sides now. I get it. I know the amount of ordinance and like suffering, which is going to come. And like, maybe I sound dramatic, but call me in six months or actually call me in five years. And we'll see whether what uh, I said turned out to be correct. Remember Aleppo did not happen until the fifth year of the Syrian civil war. Do people need to remember this? Like the most memorable parts of wars usually happen near the end, not the beginning. We're still in that period of total insanity. And that's why I think what we do on the um, diplomatic period mattered the most in the very beginning. But look, that's gone now. I'll remain a critic till it till the day I die. Um, and now going forward, look, I, I just think we're in a really bad situation. I, I know it probably sound like a broken record because what I'm actually most worried about is our domestic political consequences at home. I think people are out of their goddamn minds for believing that stupid poll that people are like, oh yeah, we'll pay higher gas prices, even if it means cutting off Russia. I'm like, Pfft. I'm like, listen, 75% of people said they supported a no-fly zone because they don't actually understand what a no-fly zone means. It's the same thing on gas. And they are going to rue the day um, that they said that increasing higher gas prices for people to support Ukraine was going to be a smart political decision. I mean, we're going to look back on this with complete and total, just like, we're, we're going to be like, I can't believe that even happened. So in this last uh, five, six minutes before we hit the hour, I want to just respond to two good short questions. Then Sagar, um, as we're sure. working in this format, like I'd love to hear what your takeaway from just everything we've kind of talked about in a bunch of different ways. I've got mine, I'll, I'll hear yours. So here's just the first quick question that sent this morning. This is from Sam A. Question. Was the symbolic walkout of more than 100 diplomats when Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov delivered a speech in a similar way to Japan walking out of the League of Nations in 1933, that marked the beginning of Sino-Japanese conflict, Sino meaning China. Are we seeing the end of the UN in terms of the significance of that? What's what's your take? I think we just saw it a long time ago. Um, I don't know, maybe the total finality of it. what was the first conflict where the UN was totally impotent? Manchuria? Um, no, you mean the League of Nations? That? It was. Sorry, it was the. the it was. It was. Well, basically, they were coincided. So when 
Yeah, so 1931 actually. So it was it was it was when the Japanese it was when the Japanese yeah. invaded um, Manchuria and China, right. and then when the Italians um, invaded Abyssinia, which is what. That's right. By the way, I love Abyssinia is such a sick name. I, I no 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 hate on the Ethiopians. I'm sure there's like a colonial reason, but that was the name. But uh, Abyssinia when they invaded Abyssinia in my 1930s announcer voice. Yeah. So it, I think we've already had those periods. I mean, Syria was definitely one of them. Um, you know, a lot of people won't like this, but Israel's definitely been part of this one for a long time. So I just think it's been impotent for a long time. That being said, it could be just like when we write the retrospectives, the nails in the coffin that led to this and that. But I don't think a total dissolution of the UN is going to happen. I just think it's going to remain the same impotent organization. Great history, though. It's a good, um, it's a good analogy to draw from. Yeah, and just the quick take here is that I talked about just an episode of How Brands um, came out yesterday, and he talked about the reason why he thinks the UN is going to persist, which is, remember, the League of Nations was not, no one's withdrawing from the UN over this. Yeah, right. North Korea is a member of, of the United Nations. You have... Um, you have uh, oh, obviously, yeah. and this People is this is drew from the league. Yeah, the, the the difference is remember, America was never a part of the League of Nations. So what Howe says the difference between the League of Nations, and the UN is, is the UN because it has everybody. It's not going to serve as a place where you are going to have conflicts worked out and solved. Um, but what it is going to be is is a venue of international soft power gamesmanship, right? So Ukraine having their UN ambassador attack Russia as the invasion happened, that was powerful. Um, you know, there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of just like social media moments which we could debate whether they are real or not. But I think for a lot of people, seeing the Ukrainian ambassador say to the Russian ambassador, you are a criminal, why would you do this? That really shaped this for people. And that's why the UN is going to matter. So we aren't going to treat this as a place where we solve conflicts, but we're going to treat it as a place where international diplomacy and gamesmanship comes out. So then last quick question, it goes to something you referenced, Sagar, with the fighting for your uh, country bit. So this question is from Michael B. We'd love to hear you discuss the recent Quinnipiac poll. I pronounced that wrong, I never got it right. Yeah, but yeah. Quinnipiac yeah. poll. It's one of those words I've seen on paper a lot, but I never actually say it out loud. Poll, where so many people from your all capitals generation said that if America were invaded, they would flee instead of fighting. Where would they flee? The hardest part of the scenario for me would be trying to pretend I wasn't oh, excited. Oh, don't know where you're coming from on that one, Michael, but whatever. Let's, 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 X, that, let's uh, X that part. Uh, where would they flee? Just, just respond to the actual um, bit here. Yeah. I mean, I just think these polls are really, they're just cope, like for every side. Like, everyone's like, I'm going to leave. It's like, no, you're not. Guess what? In Ukraine, they just stop people from leaving. So they literally can't leave. This is probably going to be, this. it's just such a hypothetical, it's a, probably a better barometer of like how people feel about patriotism in the country. But what did I just tell you? Things are fickle. People move all the time. Everybody's like, yeah, I support a no-fly zone. People are like, yeah, I'll pay more for gas. We'll see. Call me in six months. People are all over the map. It's more of a snapshot in time. Um, it's one of those things where you can, uh, it'll be fun to juxtapose if it ever happened to be like, 20 years ago, there was a poll that said, you know, X generation wouldn't fight. And then they signed up in droves, um, you know, the day after an attack. Look no further than 1941. By the way, appeasement was very popular. And so was, um, what's it called? The Neutrality Act was super popular at the time. Non-engagement, even at the height of the invasion of France, was also, not po was also very popular. So things can turn on a dime. December 1941, Pearl Harbor happens. And then you have a record, you know, number of people that jump and get into the war. So I just don't, I don't take these things all that serious. I think hypothetical polling is dumb. So the thing is, here's why I don't think it's, well, here's why it's dumb. Here's why it isn't dumb. It's, it's dumb because guys, any world where the U S is literally getting invaded is a world where there is nowhere else to go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Like, yeah. like, like, but so that's obviously why, so bad news guys, like the whole thing where we have this continent separate from Europe and Asia, we have two giant oceans a world where that is happening, we're screwed and we have nowhere else to go. So we're going to have to stand and fight. So that's that's the harsh reality. And in that world, Canada and Mexico are not open for business um, in that specific case. Now, here's why that poll matters. I think that poll is a good barometer of confidence in American society and American identity. So you know this from your 1930s history. There was an infamous uh, resolution at the Oxford Union where during the 1930s, um, 
they famously debated the resolution. Yeah, I would oh, yeah, not I fight for right. king and country. This is a generation that is coming of age in the wake of World War One, where an entire generation, and this is where this is, this is where like it's very hard for you and I to identify with, but the British educated upper classes because of the nature of officers led from the front actually british upper class people actually died at a higher rate yes um, like way than you know like it's it's crazy you know uh, rudyard kipling's son was killed in battle it was it's something we we will never understand this fact it goes against the way the post-draft military we operated and just post like we believe in our country will fight but basically that generation is wiped out decimated um by, by the war. So you even have the successor generation, they famously vote, we would not fight for king and country during, once again, this period in the 1933-34, where the um, invasion of Abyssinia is happening, where the invasion of Manchuria is happening. So once again, when pedal hit the metal, the generation stepped up, but that was still an important barometer for how rising Britons, especially those who were getting groomed for leadership, felt about their confidence about their country. And that also explains why, and this is where I think your explanation where Neville Chamberlain was coming from, a British society that would vote in favor of that resolution is not one where Neville Chamberlain had a lot of like room to go. So yeah, right. for, for our last bit here, Sagar, just what's your, what's your main takeaway? I'll give mine, then we'll close up shop. Uh, it's still very early. Uh, I believe we're in a form of mass formation psychosis. Shout out to uh, that trend online. And we will look back in horror and rue the day that we pursued some of the policies that we're pursuing now, which I do understand in the context of how they are happened, but will not lessen the impact upon tens of millions of people, hundreds of millions of people. And my big takeaway to offer some unsolicited advice for the, for the Biden administration, look, Biden's biggest problem, we talked about this during the State of the Union coverage, is a lack of, of a grand narrative. And it seems that there's one area where Biden could actually define his presidency, actually articulate some type of center that we could build around. It's around this topic of resiliency. I just watched uh, Darkest Hour on Netflix. This is the movie about um, Winston Churchill um, in the period after he immediately becomes prime minister, very good. Um, Gary Oldman got a Wait, I'm Oscar sorry. for I, his, I, for I his performance. Or, or, I'll dissent that. But, 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 hate, no, no, but, no, 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 yeah. no. Hear, hear, hear what I'm about to say, right? Because um, this isn't going where you think it's going. This isn't me saying, see, that's why you have to always say no to Hitler. And just all that's not the mm-hmm. bit here. There's a scene where he just very vehemently goes like, have you not learned the lesson yet? I, I, that was so like, how, and he's talking about, appeasement of Hitler. But I heard that and I'm like, man, how have we not learned the lesson that we need domestic resiliency? During COVID, we're too dependent on China, so our supply chain goes to crap. Now we are so dependent on Russian and Saudi oil that we can't even adjudicate our own foreign policy, no matter which way you want to basically go. It seems to me that what Biden needs to articulate here, that brings in your nuclear your, your nuclear power thing that builds in the oil and natural gas bit that builds in the supply chain narrative that builds in all these factors that have been frustrating on the domestic and foreign policy sides is my presidency is about making America resilient again. We are going to be energy independent. We are going to build. This is the Mark Andreessen time to build opportunity. That is the narrative he needs to set here. Because once again, that is the actual area of bipartisan agreement. In this country, everyone feels that America does not have the flexibility it needs to pursue our aims, whatever they are. That is something that you and I, who disagree on plenty of things, can agree on. So the fact that they aren't just seizing this opportunity to say explicitly, this is what our presidency is. It's not build back better. It's not me being the new FDR. This is me charting a new course. This is me rebuilding the foundation that decades of policy just tore apart. They're not going to do it to your point, but Jesus, guys, just pick it up. It's pretty straightforward. There you go. Well, there we go. That's the episode. Everyone, thanks so much. Would love comments and appreciation. Always send a tip. But uh, yeah, we'll see you next time.